So after a slight uh, delay, we are ready to get started. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker of the morning, uh, Karen Gami, who um, I had the pleasure of working with um, at a, well, when she worked um, at Prodigy Finance um, at her previous job. And she is going to be speaking to us about how to explain the black box magic of machine learning and AI to um, the business and ourselves. Cool. Uh, can everyone hear me? Cool. All right. So yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about so what's the story, uh, but more specifically, who it's for. All right. So hello, world. I'm Karen. I'm up here because I like uh, learning as much as I like presentations. Um, but basically, I want to talk about how, as the world's data is growing, so is our aptitude for AI. Okay, uh, And I think that's really powerful because it means that we can think of our problems in a really different and effective way, and we can action it in a really powerful way, too. So really, I, just, I believe in ideas that are powerful but not exclusionary. And uh, any way we can tell a story uh, and instantiate concepts through storytelling, I think we're on the right track. Cool. So you are in the right place if you like AI or if you want to like AI. Uh, if you want other people to like AI too and you like stories. Cool. So what I'm going to be covering today, uh, just kind of very high level, what are random forests and neural nets? And that's mostly just because they're really popular. Uh, and if you want to do reading afterwards, it's pretty accessible to, to just find out more information. Then I'm going to go through very briefly like the difference between TensorFlow and Keras. I'm going to go through some story time deciding which model, and then knowing your audience. Cool. So general guidelines in terms of when you're going to be doing modeling or analytics. The first step is always EDA, so do some exploratory data analysis. Just get a feel for what your data is doing, what it looks like. Then you're going to do the basic cleaning and standardizing. So if you have categorical variables that need to be one hot encoded, or whether you need to drop NANDs, that's the next thing you're going to be doing. Then you're going to be training and testing your data, or sorry, training uh, coming up with the splits for your train and testing data. So whether that's 70% training and 30% testing, that's the next step. And then finally, you're going to get onto your predictions and evaluations. And that's when the heart of the storytelling comes to life. Cool. Everyone with me so far? Awesome. Um, just very quickly, who has worked with or is working with random forests? OK. Nice. Cool. Um, so basically, you know everything that I'm going to be talking about. Um, but just stay for the animations, I guess. All right, so if you come from a school of thought which asks, you know, I'm doing decision trees, they're accessible, they're user friendly, I can explain them to my friends, why would I want to move to a random forest? Firstly, great question, um, but typically we want to move to random forest just because of the improved accuracy. Um, yeah, and I think that's a nice, a nice thing to tell your business partners and, and business friends. The other nice thing about uh, random forest is that they solve classification and regression, gre ooh, sorry, regression problems. Um, so that's really just, you know, is something fraud or not fraud? Uh, and if we're talking about, you know, giving people credit limits and their limit is somewhere between 1,000 or 2,000, what is the R squared associated with that? And should we actually be giving that kind of credit out? And then just very, very briefly how they work. Sorry, was that clear? Yeah, okay. So very, very clearly and very briefly how they work. So you're going to load your data, you're going to set your libraries, you're going to determine your target variable, which is really the thing that you want to predict for. So fraud or not fraud, or the class of fraud. Uh, you're then going to split out your data into your training and testing. Your training data is going to be bagged, which just means that it's going to be bootstrapped and aggregated. Uh, and from that bagged data, you're going to actually dis discern what are the most important variables. And that's really, really valuable. And then you're going to run your out of bag data set. So that's your testing data through the random forest classifier. And uh, that's going to help you discern whether or not your model is accurate. Cool. Make sense? Awesome. OK. Uh, and then again, very briefly, has anyone worked with neural nets and or is working with? Oh my god, there are so many cool people here. Nice. Uh, OK, cool. So again, just stay for the animations. All right, so basically, what is it? Um, this is kind of the heart of the black box, or the, the buzz black box at the moment. So what it does is it takes an input, does this kind of black box magic, and then comes out with a really wonderful output. The great thing about neural nets is that it, the universality theorem applies, which just means that regardless of the function that it needs to solve for, there is a neural net that can either solve for it 
or approximate very well for it. And that's incredibly powerful. Cool. All right, then just in terms of what it is. Um, sorry. Okay. So there are a couple of um, analogies that we have. There's the very retired brain analogy. So it's very much like a human brain. There's an input, and then synapses fire, and then a wonderful output happens. But I think anyone who works with neural nets really hates that analogy, so we're going to take that away. Um, the other way to think about it is as a composite function, which is just a function of a function, um, as a computing system. So that's kind of the typical feed-forward uh, forward diagrams we see, and then also just as a pattern interpreter. Cool. Um, so this you probably know from image classification. Um, a neural net will just try and identify different shapes um, that are kind of localized to a particular image, and then say, yes, this is a cat, or no, it is not a cat. Cool. All right. And then if we talk about activation functions, activation functions are the things that essentially make neural nets work. And if you don't have an activation function, your output's just going to be linear. And if your output needs to be linear, that's fine, but then you shouldn't use a neural net. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of activation functions that you can use. Uh, that's this part over here. Uh, sigmoid tends to be the most popular just because it's really easy to understand. Um, but there are a bunch that you can apply, and you should just read up on the maths for all of them to see how they are relevant to your problem. Cool. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, backpropagation, which in simplest terms just kind of recalibrates the gradients for your activation function, and then reweights your biases and weights. Sorry. Reweights and rebiases. Yeah, reweights and rebiases. Then you have a learning rate. These are just kind of buzz terms. So if you're not familiar with neural nets, don't, don't worry. But if you go up and read about neural nets, at least you're going to know a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so learning rate is really just how much should we be adjusting our weights and biases. Um, and then our momentum <coughs> is how much should the previous outcome affect our weights and biases. Everyone with me? Um, the typical kind of ingredients that you would need for a neural net, um, but this kind of applies to any machine or deep learning model that you're going to be using. So you need to have a network architecture. So in this case, it's uh, the input, the hidden layer, and the output layer. Then you're going to prepare your data, so standardize it, create the training and test splits, and then you're going to move on to the configuration. So you're going to randomly assign weights and biases. It really doesn't matter what, you're gonna, uh, what you set them as, they're going to be adjusted later. Then you're going to choose an activation function, so maybe a sigmoid, maybe something else. Then you're going to adjust the weights and the biases through backpropagation, and you're going to iterate until you get to the desired error level. Cool. Then when you get to the actual training and testing and validation, you're going to run that through the untrained data, so your test data, and then see sort of how well your model did. Cool. So I'm just going to go through this animation, and then I'll explain it. So Watch along. So I'm just going to go through it step by step. So basically, on, on the left, where the blue is, those are our inputs. And then you see the weights 1 all the way to 6. Those are our weights. Then you're going to see B1 to 3, which are our biases. And then nodes 1 to 3, that's the hidden layer. And then the green bubbles are our outputs. Okay. So basically what's happening is um, over here, we're literally just summing up um, kind of, yeah. So we're saying x1 times our first weight, and then we're saying x2 times weight number four. Okay, so we're going there, and we're going there. We're summing those two together, and then we're adding the bias that's associated to it. And then we kind of iterate through the three nodes. What we're going to do is we're going to use our activation function, and in this case, it would be a sigmoid or something. And that essentially just squashes it so that we can get a probability associated to it. OK? And then we're going to sum those up, and we're going to come up with a prediction. That prediction is probably going to be really terrible just because we've randomly set our weights and our biases, so we have no idea what they're meant to be. But backpropagation essentially uses the chain rule to kind of readjust those weights and biases to get closer to the desired outcome. Cool. Awesome. And then you would use your learning rates and your momentum if you need to, uh, again, just to see how big your adjustment should be. 
awesome. And then you're going to iterate through either how many epochs you've decided on, and epochs is just how many times your data is going to run through the set. Okay. Cool. Um, so I know people like to have this conversation a lot, uh, TensorFlow versus Keras, uh, and I think kind of before we get there, um, a very important question to ask your friends who are super excited about those libraries uh, or yourself is just, you know, can you build it? If you can build it, do you know how to break it or what makes it break? Um, and if yes to both those things, then you probably understand it and then you can probably use those libraries. But I think principally only use libraries <coughs> or functions that you yourself can do either by hand or, you know, very basically. Um, and then once you understand it, you can apply those same principles. Cool. Um, so I very often like to just kind of write down my functions, uh, so whether it's a neural net or a random forest, and kind of do just one example by hand, one row by hand. And that kind of eliminates the black boxiness to it, number one. Also makes me feel like I understand it a little better. <clears throat> and then I can understand it. Um, sorry. I can understand it and then relate that idea to whoever needs it. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is just a very simple, uh, I guess, hand-built neural net. Uh, so this is what I like to call build a network. Um, got a little builder bear over there. Um, but yeah, really you just kind of assign your own weights, your own inputs and outputs, and then you come up with your, excuse me, your backprop uh, function. Okay. All right. But then when we actually move into TensorFlow versus Keras, is there a difference? I mean, yes, TensorFlow is kind of like the heart and soul of deep learning right now, um, and it offers a lot more control and insight into your models, whereas Keras is a lot more user-friendly and accessible. It also looks a lot better, in my opinion. Um, and then when we combine the two, we kind of get this holy, I guess, matrimony of uh, deep learning libraries. So yeah. Cool. Uh, now it's actually uh, time for the story. Okay. So Guido van Rossum, who was the founder of Python, he recently stepped down as benevolent dictator for life uh, earlier this year. And I don't know if you know, but <laughs> he's actually really good at origami. And uh, that's going to be his new business venture, making origami. And uh, yeah, so he's good at two things, making roses and tulips, which are the easiest of the flowers, but whatever. Okay. Um, and he's obviously really good at kind of documenting uh, his data with respect to the flowers that he builds. So he always uh, writes down the length and the width and then the type. Okay. Except in this time uh, where he didn't classify it, so we don't know if that is a rose or a tulip. And uh, where it says type there, um, rose is one and tulip is zero. So in this instance, we don't know if it's a rose or a tulip. Yuck. But luckily, his best friend, Mr. Model, it's kind of an anthology of machine learning and deep learning algorithms, and Mr. Model's going to help him kind of classify this problem. Great. So Mr. Model says that we should use a neural net, uh, and it's going to use the sigmoid function because it's super easy. Um, yeah. And so this is a hand-built neural net. Obviously, there are fancier ones in, in TensorFlow and those kind of libraries, but just to get the principal understanding, um, I'm trying, or Guido's trying to figure out this gray dot over here, is it a rose, a one, or a tulip, a zero? Okay. And I think when you look at this data, it's like a little bit unclear. If you're looking sort of vertically, it looks like it could be a rose, but if you're looking kind of horizontally, it could be a tulip. Cool. Then over here, we just have the basic kind of network architecture. Here we have our uh, activation function. So the green line is the sigmoid itself, and then this, I guess, kind of olive line is the uh, derivative. Cool. OK, so now we're going to train. And we've just randomly assigned our weights over here and our biases. It's the number of iterations. This is our learning rate. And essentially, we're going to get our cost function over here. And what we want is for our cost function to go down. And it looks like it has, so great. Cool. And then again, here we have our predictions. So here we're using our sigmoid. And if you remember, rows is 1 and tulip is 0. OK. so. It's very likely a rose with that, that number over there. So 0 0.97 is closer to 1 than it is to 0. So it's probably a rose. Um, and if 
And if we were to plot that, you would kind of see that it, it falls very nicely in the row space over there. Cool. Does that make sense? Awesome. All right, so story time continues. Um, so he's actually doing really well in the, uh, in the origami business, and he's, he's actually started lending out money to, to people who want to buy roses or tulips. Um, so great. However, he's starting to encounter some, some fraudulent characters, some snakes, if you will. And uh, so I come along and I'm like, look, dude, I, I really want some credit for some dope flowers, but I see you won't accept my proof of income. Why? Uh, basically, he thinks I'm a snake, uh, which is just really rude. Um, but he's identified a, a larger problem, which is you know, uh, fraud. And he kind of wants to classify, given a set of data, sort of what, what fraud exists, I mean, what potential fraud exists. So we're predicting, we're trying to predict this thing called class. So zero equals you know, fake, i.e. it is fraudulent, and one equals real. So it's an authentic proof of income or bank document or whatever. OK. So I'm not going to run through the notebook itself. I'm just going to show you the output. But OK, so this is what happened when I used a neural net and a random forest on the same data. Um, so over here, here's the confusion matrix, and here's my classification report. So in the confusion matrix, I can see you know, it's done pretty well. And actually, in the classification report, it's identified everything perfectly. So I can perfectly identify whether or not someone is fraudulent or a snake. Um, and that's, you know, that's really great. Whereas over here, when I did the random forest, it's still a really good kind of accuracy level, 99%, but it's not 100%. Okay. And I guess that kind of begs the question, you know, which model should you be using? Um, so I kind of want to bring up the idea of there's, there's no free lunch. Uh, so when you're choosing a model, you know, random forest versus a neural net, it's not that easy. Okay. Uh, so there's no one best model for one situation. There are trade-offs with all models. Um, testing multiple models on, on one set of data can lead to overfitting, and maybe you get a really good answer just because of luck or chance, or that's just how the data was, um, but it might not always be the case. <coughs> Bless you. Um, <laughs> and then training many models or using different types of models can be incredibly time-consuming and resource-intensive, especially when we're talking about deep learning models. OK, so I guess, yeah, so which model for what? What you should do is kind of work on your features and try and improve upon your data. So if you have any, I guess, power in your workplace and you can convince the powers that be that you know, it's worth spending money getting really good data, I mean, do that and make sure you're loud, make sure you're proud about it. Um, and then, yeah, also just try and think of things in terms of how they relate to each other. So how much do your false positives or false negatives matter? Um, so I guess in the context of if you're predicting a natural disaster, you don't want to incorrectly predict that there is a, a tornado coming because there are lives at stake. So in that instance, it makes sense to get the best model you can and train and test as much as possible. Versus you know, if you're just kind of playing around with, with some data you have at home and you're just predicting flowers, it, it actually doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Cool. And then lastly, just sort of which story for which person. So when you're relaying this, or you're relaying your models to an audience, try and identify who your audience is. So I have three types of audiences there. There's just hello, hello world, and then print hello world. Hello is kind of the non-technical users. Um, and I think the best, in my experience at least, the best way that they like to receive these models is you know, just tell them what it is and tell them how it affects us or them. Us being the business, them maybe being their department, if that's kind of who you're modeling for. If you're dealing with, with someone who's a little bit more technical but doesn't actually use Python or deep learning or anything like that, so maybe this is just a business analyst or something, <clears throat> I think it helps to give them the theory. Um, they do tend to appreciate that kind of like intellectual engagement. So definitely present them with the theory, see how far they want to go with it, and then just show them principally. And again, you can do that by hand or you can do that just with one row or whatever, but show them principally how it works and how it works for them or for us. And then finally, when you're dealing with kind of hello world over here, um, you know, send them the tutorial, send them the GitHub link, uh, the journal article, send them everything, and then kind of let them fight with you afterwards. So yeah. In conclusion, uh, there's really just four steps to 
to data and presenting data. One, know your data. Two, know your models. Three, know your audience. And then finally, know your story. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. We have um, some time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand. And we also have 100 US dollars of Microsoft Azure credits to give away to a question that Karen likes. Oh, nothing hard. <laughs> what questions do you like? <laughs> Were you asking seriously? Or? Oh. <laughs> um, I, I usually like questions that are like, um, you know, what was the most fun you had doing this? Those are kind of my favorite questions. What was the most fun you had doing this? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, the animations. So I was going to um, ask you, how long did that take to make this presentation? So if I'm, if I'm not being honest, an hour. If I'm being honest, a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, That's really well done for a couple of days. <laughs> it's <laughs> <Thank> beautiful. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I was just wondering, um, you, talk, uh, you talked about TensorFlow and Keras there. Um, have you tried PyTorch by any time? I have not, but everyone keeps badgering me about it, so I feel really bad, and I shouldn't have even brought it up. But no, I have not tried PyTorch yet. Right. Okay. Are you a big advocate for PyTorch? No, I just wanted to know oh. if it compared. <laughs> I think maybe she has the answer. I'll come back to you. You've had one. Um, so you mentioned TensorFlow and Keras. Um, which library would you recommend if somebody wanted to like mess with um, some of the like finer details of like selection or um, like you know like generating the pool and making them do stuff. Definitely TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just go so 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 deep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually like a little bit overwhelming just how deep you can go. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely. Cool. Thank stuff. you. Um, yeah. Uh, can you comment on TensorFlow, sort of the community in South Africa? Whether they how sort of to what how active is it? I mean, are they sort of recommended groups or forums or meetups or that you know about? That's such a good question. All my TensorFlow friends, I mean, they're South African, but they now work either in Portugal or London or whatever. I think there's just a, a general brain drain problem when it comes to like data scientists and, and analysts here. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I can always give you their names and email addresses if you want friends, TensorFlow friends. <laughs> Um, from your experience, how do you select the number of neurons and hidden nodes in your neural network? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know of the magic formula. If it does exist, you know, someone please tell me. I think really just trial and error. I think the one thing that really does help is, is the first step, which is EDA. So explore your data and understand kind of what it looks like. Also understand what exactly you're trying to model for and then just I guess thumb suck and do a really good thumb suck and then come up with the, the number of hidden layers. Um, I always start with one and if it's not enough then you know go back to the drawing board. Um, another thing I like to do is just kind of bounce ideas off other people. What do they think? Um, especially people who are more experienced than I am. Um, yeah. Was that a, a really good question like this <laughs> or uh, not? What? Was that a, you said it started off by saying that was a really good question. Oh, that is a really good question, yeah. <laughs> well, now I feel less inclined to ask a question. <laughs> um, you spent a lot of time talking about neural nets. Can, can you spend another minute talking about random forests? For those of us that don't know much about them, neural nets have been sort of all the rage now. But sure. Uh, yeah, is there something in particular you want to know? Um, I don't know, uh, more info, in, in a general, I, I feel you've spent most of the talk um, helping us to understand neural nets, um, 
but I still have no feel for for random forests and and sure. how they how they work. Sure. Okay. So I mean, they they definitely like uh, I, I guess take off where decision trees sort of stop. So a decision tree, you know what a decision tree is and looks like. So essentially, it kind of just takes a. I actually have a nice illustration. Uh, let me. Um, okay, so we have that big green dancing box, which is our whole data set. Then we have the smaller part, which is our training data set, and then the testing one, which is the yellow one. And so the red block is the one that we're going to bag, which is, you know, bootstrap and, um, and aggregate. And then, it's not very clear, but that dotted line that says yes and no, that column, that's essentially what we would want to predict for, so column N. Okay. Um, Okay. So yeah, so just in terms of, of actually like the value of, of random forests that you don't necessarily get from decision trees. Um, so if this is our training data set over here, what it's going to do is it's going to bootstrap that data. So you're going to have a much bigger and much more robust and randomized data set that came just from your training set. So for instance, I might have um, in these two subs, I mean these three subsets over here, all of which are, are a bootstrapped set of the training data. Uh, I might have, you know, row one up to row 300 in here. I might have random rows like 10 and 20 and then rows 300 onwards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how you get this very large data set. And so that's one where the bootstrapping happens and then the aggregation. And then, these colors are awful, I'm sorry. Um, but essentially from your subsets of the training data, the ones you've bootstrapped and aggregated, you're then going to kind of make decision trees for all of them. And from the decision tree, you're going to predict, you know, the column you were, you were trying to classify. Um, and then what happens is this thing called voting. So it's going to essentially count the number of classifications that you had. And then the highest number of classifications is the one that is, I guess that's the one that's actually going to be classified. So in this instance, uh, at the bottom here, you can see that this decision tree said that variable B, and then decision tree 2 said it was variable C, and decision tree M said it was variable B again. So if you add all those up, uh, add all of them up, B is the most, uh, I guess, the most common answer. So the mode of that is then your most predictive variable. So you get your variable importance there. Okay. Um, cool. And then essentially you're going to run your, so this was our testing data or our validation data and you're going to run, run it through the decision tree classifier and pretty much get to the same, same thing. Um, yeah, and then you'll do, you know, whatever you want, a confusion matrix or classification report to see what your, your type one and type two errors are. Um, yeah. Does that, does that explain it? Awesome. Hi, um, I just had a quick comment on the, um, I mean, the million dollar question is, you know, how many neurons, how deep should a neural network go? And there's a really good blog post by Andrew Trask. I'm not sure if people are aware of that, but that sort of goes into how to think about um, finding out the answer for your problem. So definitely check, uh, it's somebody worth following anyway, if you're interested in deep learning and machine learning. So Amazing. Andrew Trask uh, blog post. Cool, thank answers you. that question quite well. Thank you very much. Um, I've sort of lost track who's waiting to answer questions, so if you're waiting to answer a question, just put up your hand, and I'm going to try and leave this area where I've been for a while. Uh, thanks for the talk, it's very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to know, um, can you perhaps give us some sort of examples of real-world problems that uh, you are most excited or interested in that you've managed to solve uh, through machine learning? whether it's like neural nets or whatever. Sure. Um, so I don't want to say solved because it's not, it's not really solved yet, um, but in the process of solving, I guess. Um, so if I look at random forests in particular, so 
at work we use decision trees for a couple of reasons. One, you know, our, just our capability system can only work with decision trees for that kind of decision engine. Um, but and then also kind of, so context, I work at a financial services firm, Woolworths Financial Services, so we work on uh, three different products, uh, credit card, personal loan, and store card. So then we assign limits for all of those products and you know we either increase or reduce limits, whatever. Um, yeah, so when we're just kind of setting people's credit limit increases, uh, typically we use decision trees to do that. Um, and Random Forest, I think, provides a much more robust way to do that. Um, and particularly in the context of IFRS 9, which is a new accounting policy, um, it means that you know when you're assigning a credit limit, uh, you have to hold stock for the unutilized portion as well because you're assuming that someone could go bad. Um, and that's really expensive. So if I give you 100,000 and I have 100,000 myself and you utilize, say, 10,000 10, and I utilize, say, 90,000, I still, as a business, have to hold 90,000 worth of stock just for you. So that's a lot of money. So if we can better engineer the way in which we assign limits and assign credit limit increases and those sort of things using, say, a random forest or just something that can provide us more accuracy. I mean, bonuses for everyone. A uh, question from the outs looking from the outside in. It seems that a lot of work has gone into the AI portion of the problem. How much work is being done on data preparation on the input side and on the output side, evaluating the correctness or validity of what this thing spits out? Yeah. Um, I wish there was another voucher because that's a really good question. Um, but just in terms of the input, so I guess it depends on sort of what your company does and where you get your data from. Um, where I work, we get our data from, because we're a joint venture, um, we get our data from you know, one of the people who sort of own us. Um, so whatever they do to their data is what they do. They have a mandate as to how much data they're willing to buy and distribute to us. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. So when we want more data, we want a specific kind of data, it's, it's like a whole bureaucratic schlep to get that. Um, so that's the first issue. So obviously if you, if you have that kind of power to get data and, and make informative decisions about your data, like you should, and I think the business will definitely thank you. Then in terms of the, uh, the output, yeah, I mean, I would like to assume that it's, it's like your more senior analysts and like people who just know a lot more things than, say, a me, uh, who can kind of critically assess whether or not you've, you've gone through all the right steps and whether or not your decisions make sense. Um, yeah. So just out of curiosity, do you, are you just using feed-forward networks, or do you have some kind of recurrent neural networks as well? I mean, no, there are people who are doing cool stuff with uh, recurrent neural nets. I'm not, because I'm kind of a baby, uh, but no. no. Cool. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, roughly, depending on how long the questions are. I just want to ask about your rose and tulip example. Um, it seemed quite, you know, you gave this definitive answer. It was like 97%. Um, but I think that's a bit misleading. And I think it depends very much on the number of neurons that you chose. And I th yeah, I would like to know uh, if you want to, if I can put it as a question. So um, what were the values for the different number of neurons? Oof. Or otherwise, uh, maybe a recommendation if you do that again to like kind of show show what the, how it changes. Yeah. Um, can I find you afterwards and I'll just run you through the the notebook? Is that okay? Cool. Oh, do we have? Yes, we have one more question. Uh, cool. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I really appreciated that you were talking a bit about the context around the work as well as what you are actually doing. Um, something I was wondering about is. Uh, can you maybe talk a bit about when you choose to tell your story uh, or how you change the story depending at which point you are in the process and maybe talking about those different types of uh, audiences, uh, how, how you adjust it for those different like stages. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I guess it depends very much on, on who the, the initial story is for. So if it's just for kind of someone in my team uh, and that's the, the credit risk team that I'm a part of, um, then it's very easy to sort of keep everyone engaged and they form very much. Uh, some of them are 
the second audience and some of them are the third audience. Um, but I think just because the jargon is very common to them, just in terms of credit risk, it's very easy to onboard them with the story already. So we're doing credit limit increases or we're doing decreases or whatever. Um, and these are, this is the history of how we do it. So here's the repository of what we've done before, the last strategy, and here's how we're going to change it. So I, f I feel like that's a very easy conversation to have, and, and the story isn't, isn't too animated, I guess. Um, I do find it tricky when your end users are people who are not necessarily in your immediate circle. So if I was doing something for, I don't know, direct marketing or um, portfolio performance or something, like they just speak in very different <laughs> jargon. So first it's like, what do all these things mean? <laughs> and can we not use that jargon because I don't even understand it. So when I'm trying to model for whatever it is, um, you know, I'm struggling. And then in terms of sort of either changing the story or changing the narrative, and I don't know if you mean specifically like when you have to change the type of model that you're doing, is that what you mean? Or I, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, how do you sort of explain wh your level of confidence, for example, say because you're quite early on in the process and you found some interesting stuff, but you're still working things out. Like how do you, when you're talking to that non-technical audience, how do you convey your level of confidence in addition to your uh, you know, where you are really. Sure. Okay. Um, I guess I'm quite fortunate just in the sense of the way in which my team is structured. So I feel like a lot of those, a lot of those questions are shielded just by the way in which our organization works. So typically they won't speak to me first. They'll speak to me kind of at the end of the, the process. They'll speak to like maybe a line manager or a project manager or something. Um, so obviously it's my task to, if I'm speaking to my line manager, someone who is very technical, so third audience over there, it's very easy to, to you know, deliver those ideas. Uh, if it's a project manager who's either you know, audience one or audience two, um, again, it's really just kind of breaking down the jargon and then just showing them principally how things work and why we're doing this instead of that. And I think that kind of just gives people the confidence in, in you and you also have more confidence in you because at least you know why you're doing this instead of that. Cool. Um, thank you very much, Karen.